So thanks for the introduction. Um, I've got some slides to share. Uh, I want to make sure there's some truth in advertising here. Um, I'm an entomologist. I wouldn't call myself an expert in engineering, uh, but I rely upon some collaborations with engineers to address some ongoing questions we have with regards to honeybee ecology and management. And I thought I'd share some of that with you all. Um, first, from the perspective of an entomologist, I've got a, a little story to tell um, about how uh, entomologists like me try to track where bees are in our environment. And uh, I'll try to explain why that's important. Uh, and then I'll talk about a project that I did with a group of engineering students at uh, Iowa State University to expand the toolbox that we have for tracking insects. And I'll uh, give you a heads up. Um, there's very little you're gonna learn about how to be a better beekeeper from what I'm gonna talk about. But I will talk about at the end, um, uh, one large project that a bunch of us are doing here at Iowa State, where we're pursuing um, a conservation practice called prairie strips. And this is totally safe for work. If you go Googling this, you can Google strips at Iowa State and you'll find uh, more than you could ever uh, want to know about this practice. And I'll talk a little bit about how um, adding strips of native perennial vegetation back to our landscape can increase beekeeping and honey productivity, honeybee productivity uh, in the form of increased honey production. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So um, please tell me to stop talking and uh, um, ask questions. I'm a recovering extrovert, so I have a tendency to just keep talking and talking. So um, if you hear something that wasn't clear, um, shout out or I'll try to keep an eye on the chat for questions. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Hopefully you can see this. And it sounds okay? You can. All right, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was hired here at Iowa State University to deal with this pest. This is an invasive insect called the soybean aphid, which has fundamentally changed how we grow soybeans in this part of the world, which is, uh, oh, 9 million acres in Iowa, uh, several uh, fold that throughout the Midwest. And because of this pest that arrived in 2000 and established over a decade, we now grow a lot of our soybeans with uh, a seed treatment. Usually this is a neonicotinoid. You've probably heard about that in the news. Uh, there's evidence that they have harmful impacts on honeybees as well as wild bees. And then we also are spraying more pesticides on corn and soybeans uh, in the form of aerial applications like you see here. My lab has looked at how how uh, we might use beneficial insects like these natural enemies of the aphid, the uh, lady beetles, <laughs> excuse me. And one of the things that we've uh, investigated is how the surrounding landscape and these uh, insecticides affect the beneficial insect community in these soybean fields. And in exploring the larger community of insects and uh, soybeans, we found this occurring quite often, um, not just honeybees, but wild bees uh, that are found visiting soybean flowers. And given the increase in insecticide use and the challenges to keeping bees throughout the United States, if not Iowa and the Midwest, uh, we've been asked this question often, are there bees in these Iowa farms? As we've increased insecticide use by about 140% since the arrival of the soybean aphid. I'm going to talk about some work that a graduate student that I co-advised, Ashley St. Clair, and I did with a, a larger group here at Iowa State to try to answer this question. And I'll tell you a little bit of a story as to why this is kind of an important question. Um, is it fair to say that some of you um, have listened to NPR before? Guilty? Yeah? All right. I see one hand go up, uh, you're my people. So uh, you're probably familiar with the, uh, oh, Sue raised her hand, great. Um, so you've probably heard of Radiolab. 
and Robert Krollrich uh, is one of the, yeah, okay. Um, he's one of the co-creators and he gets so many ideas that they kind of spill over into a blog. Uh, this is one that he, uh, it didn't make prime time, but he did talk about it in a blog uh, titled Corn Stocks Everywhere, but nothing else, not even a bee. And it's a bit of a book report that he did on two books. One is um, a summary well, they're both a uh, summary, but one is a, a World in One Cubic Foot by David Lichtschwanger and, oh, An Apocalyptic Plant, Field Guide to the Ever-Ending Earth by Craig Child. Lichtschwanger is a photographer, goes around the world for art, uh, uh, publications like National Geographic. And he takes this green box with him wherever he goes and he plops it down uh, in the soil, about half full of soil, half full with above ground biomass. And he takes everything that he finds inside that box and he photographs it. And this is um, kind of a scientific approach to accounting for biodiversity. It's a sample size of one, but it's a pretty extensive way of accounting for all the species from plants to animals that are in there. And there's quite a few insects that he sees. And he reports this uh, data, these photographs in this uh, book um, with photographs like this, where uh, this is the Finbos, the uh, South African version of what we would call in this part of the world in Iowa, a prairie. And Lichwanger's book was kind of influential to this guy, Craig Childs, who's a bit of a environmentalist. And Craig, uh, in an interview with um, Krolwich, notes that he spent two nights and three days, we'll call it a long weekend, smack in the middle of a 600 acre farm in Grundy County, Iowa. That's about the center of the state. 600 acre farm is kind of small, but uh, not unusual for this part of the world. And uh, he went out and unlike Lichwanger, who took his camera in a box, he stayed in this field over the course of the weekend. And he said he found almost nothing. He said, I listened and I heard nothing. No bird, no click of an insect. There were no bees. I, I added that emphasis. Um, in part because, um, it's, this was done in August. And um, if you're at all familiar with corn production and especially corn that looks, oh shoot, uh, what just happened? Sorry about that. Corn that looks like it does here in the bottom corner. Um, you wouldn't be surprised that there was no bees there. One, because corn's a wind pollinated plant. And by the time the plant is developing years like this, it's not shedding any pollen. That pollen has already been shed. Uh, uh, the tassels, the silks have already been pollinated and the business end of the plant that bees would be uh, interested in are, um, are gone. So, yeah, there's no bees there because there's nothing in that field that a bee would want. And that got me thinking about, well, are there bees in corn and soybean fields when the business end of the plants are you know, available to bees? So the tassels, even though corn is wind pollinated, produce a, a ton of pollen. And if hungry enough, bee, honeybees will visit that. And soybeans have been bred for self-pollinization, but they produce a ton of flowers, which are small, but produce pollen and nectar. And much of the honey in the Midwest is, if not partially soybean honey, it's maybe all soybean honey with a mix of clover. And beekeepers in the South of the United States, like Mississippi, actively seek out soybean fields in the summer uh, to take advantage of that nectar flow. So in Iowa, it, we were scratching our head wondering, well, are there actually bees here in these fields? And again, the, ins the plants themselves do not require insect pollination, but there are resources there. And if you go out and just you know, do the kind of Lichschwanger approach, uh, you'll see bees visiting these fields. But that's somewhat, uh, I shouldn't say subjective, but that's somewhat limited as a form of data collection. And if we want to start being more uh, precise, we're going to have to come up with ways to monitor bees. But then it asks the question, well, why should we monitor bees in these fields? And 
maybe take a moment to ask you all why that might be of value. And maybe uh, corn and soybeans aren't grown so much in your part of the world, but there are other crops that would be visited. Any thoughts on that? Oh, I'm looking at the chat. What, sort, wait, of, what, 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 what sort of bees are you talking about? Like stick, solitary bees, which, could which be I could see being there, but like if there's no provender, you're not going to get honeybees because the, the beekeepers aren't going to bring them there. And, I'm there's sorry, no cavities, but, and there's no cavities for them. I, I, I didn't quite hear you on the first part of there. You said if there was no, and then- I said, uh, I said, I asked what sort of bees you're talking about, solitary bees? which of course there are many, um, or honeybees. Honeybees is a whole different kettle of fish because honeybees require cavities, which may not be very plentiful in the uh, middle of a cornfield, and uh, or they require a beekeeper to bring the hives. But solitary bees, perhaps make more sense i i don't know what do you what do you what is the purpose of the question well i uh a challenge to you all to think about why we it would be of any interest to um survey bees in crop fields and you're right there are different types of bees there are wild bees that are mostly solitary um ground nesting there's four thousand bees species that have been documented in North America, the majority are ground nesting, um, about 80% are ground nesting, the others are stem nesting. And yeah, honeybees do require some uh, management. Most honeybees that are found in this part of the world are managed. We don't, in, in Iowa, we, we really lack feral colonies. We don't have the, um, the nesting habitat for them, the, the wooded areas and all. Um, So one, one thing to think about here is in general, across the United States, and this is and, and across North America and much of the world, there's been a decline reported in a variety of individual studies in the uh, abundance and diversity of bees, both honeybees and native wild bees. And the current hypothesis for why this is happening is, um, summarized as the three P's. The first one is, the first P is pesticides. And these are uh, a group of authors that published this article in Science in 2015 noted that there are um, three types of pesticides. Well, actually two classes of pesticides, insecticides like pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. And these are two that are commonly used in crop production, not just here, but in California. And then a group of fungicides that uh, may not immediately kill the bee, but synergize with pesticide, with these insecticides to have an impact on bee health and, and uh, so sublethal and lethal impacts. So that's one P. The other P are parasites and pathogens. So for honeybees, this would be varroa mites, but it's not limited to varroa mites. It can be uh, a growing list of viruses that are easily transmitted among honeybee colonies, but also between honeybees and wild bees. And then the last P is poor forage, or as Goulson refers to it, as limited floral resources. And, and they note I, that- yeah, you're, go gonna get to, I get, I, you're gonna get to this, I'm sure, because I know the prairie, prairie strips. But yeah, lack of habitat seems to be a driver for huge amounts of species destruction. And I'm guessing that's probably true in this case too. It could, yep, yeah, but uh, we recognize that these are um, um, not mutually exclusive. Some of these stressors are occurring sometimes all at once. And uh, in order to determine which is the driver, as you point out, um, we have to come up with some measure, we have some way to measure the abundance and diversity of bees in our landscapes. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been the focus of some of the work I've been doing here at Iowa State over the last decade. I wanna share a little bit of that with you. 
And this is kind of basic entomology. Um, what I teach our undergraduates and graduate students here at Iowa State. There's six general sampling techniques. This textbook. In situ just means you look at the plant. Knockdown is you, you, you beat the plant and you catch what falls off of it. Netting is butterfly net. Trapping is using some kind of trap, often uh, baited with something. And then for critters that live in the soil, we can extract the soil or we can use indirect techniques and look for evidence of uh, what the insects might have left behind. So if it's a herbivore, we're looking for damage uh, to the plant. For bees, um, trapping has been one of the ways that we've tried to track the abundance and diversity of them in our landscapes. So trapping is anything that captures an insect. And this is a, again, kind of a standard model, what we would call a pan trap coupled with a pheromone lure, some kind of volatile attractant that is species specific. In this case, the lure is gonna bring that insect in. Oftentimes it's a sex-based pheromone that would attract one of the, uh, either a male or female who's looking for a mate. And the soapy water captures them and holds them in place. So we can come back after some time and see what's there. The, if we're trying to track honeybees, or any bee for that matter, um, a group out of uh, USGS uh, led by Sam Drogi started developing protocols for what are called, uh, for modified pan traps, what you see here, or what he calls bee bowls. These bee bowls are solo cups that are either left white, factory white coming off of the um, production line, or painted yellow and blue to match the colors that the bees would, that honeybees and other bees would find attractive, mimicking the, um, the floral cues that they would hone in on. And these have been shown to be fairly uh, attractive and successful in capturing a variety of pollinators, bees, and some non-bee pollinators in multiple habitats. And it's been recommended that these three colors be used to capture the variety, the diversity of bees, because some are uh, more likely to respond to one color than another. So having the combination of the three gets us a better chance of capturing the full diversity in an area. In my part of the world, as an applied entomologist, um, we're already recommending a variety of sampling tools for farmers to use to determine if pests are in their fields, to determine if they need to use insecticides. And some of these traps have features uh, similar to the bee bowls. So this is what's called a Farrakhan AM yellow sticky trap. It's used in a variety of cropping systems. Yellow is kind of a universal attractant to a large number of bee spe uh, insect species. And this is hung uh, vertically with some sticky substance on it and an insect flying along, hits it, attracted to it, stuck to it, and then we count how many are there to get a sense of their abundance. So about, uh, shoot, uh, eight years ago or so, we were approached by a large um, agribusiness uh, and they were asking us, come up with methods that would help them determine if there were bees in crop fields. And these traps at the time hadn't been, the bee bowls hadn't been used in corn and soybeans, but these others had, but nobody had really looked to see if there were any bees on them. So they wanted to know, and as did I, what pollinators are in the, uh, we started with soybeans. And one of the methods we use for sampling, I talked about this a moment ago, is netting. So this is a, what's called a sweet net. This is not soybeans, this is alfalfa, but it's a lovely picture to illustrate how we would do this. We would drag this net through the foliage and capture whatever falls off. Um, we compared that with yellow sticky traps that we put out to monitor pests. And then we put out these bee bowls and we kept them at the canopy height. Uh, one, so that foraging bees could see them if they flew overhead. Um, and two, we could avoid foliage falling into the the cup of soapy water to you know, make sure bees had a chance to get captured. And this is what we found. Uh, if we compared, this is just from one season uh, 
of sampling, it gives you a pretty clear indication of how successful some of these tools are. Uh, Beeble's clearly captured the most in terms of abundance um, compared to sweet nets, which really didn't capture any bees at all. They're much too clever uh, to be caught in that net. Uh, Stinky traps captured a few, but really not enough to give us the whole story of what, were, what was in those fields. And to confirm that what we found was actually foraging on soybeans, we looked at the bees for evidence of soybean pollen. So this is what a soybean pollen grain looks like. And there are libraries developed by the USDA and a, and a variety of researchers um, of pollen uh, morpho, uh, morphological features to help uh, people like me determine what plant that pollen came from. So this is what soybean pollen looks like. And what we found was when we took the bees that had evidence of pollen on them, um, and then we looked, so that's a subset of the 40 some species we found. Uh, here were uh, those individuals by species that had pollen on them, and then those that had pollen on them that had soybean on them. And this was just from um, one uh, set of fields. We found about a third of the, uh, the samples had evidence of soybean pollen on them. So that doesn't mean that the ones that didn't have soybean pollen on them weren't visiting soybeans. They could have been just visiting for nectar, but a fair number had evidence that they were visiting the plant, which gives us some confidence that this bee bowl is capturing something to do with the bees being in the field for the soybeans and not for the attractiveness of a trap. All right, so this is where the drama kicks in, uh, at least drama in an academic sense. So should bee bowls be used? I'm gonna to return to this question a couple of times. In a paper by Pendergrass, a group of, uh, et al., a group of Australian entomologists and ecologists, they note in the title of the paper, the relative performance of sampling methods for native bees, an empirical test and review of the literature. They compared six methods, some of the ones that I just talked about, as well as pan traps or the bee bowls. And they quote, results from the present study differed from most previous studies in the extremely low catch rates in pan traps. And they note a disadvantage of pan traps, quote, only catch low flying bees. And the authors note that they put pan traps on or 20 centimeters above the ground. So uh, they didn't capture a lot of bees and the ones they did capture, they said, well, they're the only ones that fly low to the ground. And that had us thinking that, well, maybe if you move the trap higher, you might capture more bees. And one plant that grows pretty high in our part of the world is corn. So we built this structure that you see here, this telescoping series of uh, PVC tubes. And we mounted our three colors of bee bowls at three different heights. Uh, at the ground level, you can't see it, uh, but at what would be the ear level where the corn ear would be, you see there. Hopefully, can you see my uh, little cursor going around? Hope so. And then up at yes. the, okay, yes. great. Thanks. And then up at what will be the tassel height when the corn fully grows. Um, and that's kind of demonstrated in this uh, cartoon. So unlike the ecologist in uh, Australia, we looked along a, a, pro, a height profile. And our hypothesis here was, yeah, you know, you're more likely to find bees up here where the business end of the plant for the bee is than say down here. Now, I think maybe it was Jim or someone mentioned, well, there's ground nesting bees and maybe you'll capture them as they're visiting their ground nest. True. But if we're trying to come up with protocols to determine how many bees and the diversity of bees in these fields are, uh, especially if we're gonna start testing hypotheses about, well, is it the pesticide use in these crop fields or is it the land use around there? These are some of the methodological questions we have to work out. So this is what we found in terms of pollinator abundance by height. So 
this is abundance, how many average number of bees that we found in uh, pollinators, I should say, not just bees, because some of what we were finding were um, flies that are uh, also pollinators. Most of what we found were these little sweat bees, but we added them all up together for this analysis. And sure enough, the majority of the bees were found at the anther height. Subset at the ear, and, but very few at the ground. So yeah, pendergrass, if you move the trap up higher to where the flowers are, you're gonna find more bees. Except for not all of the pollinators responded in that way. Uh, the flies responded a bit differently. They were the lowest number statistically, or at least numerically, was at the anther level. The majority, the, uh, or not the majority, but most of them uh, were found at the ear or ground level. And this is, I think, ha we think has to do with the multiple feeding guilds that critters like these uh, flower visiting flies inhabit. The adults visit flowers. The larvae are often found on the plant where other insects are like insect pests. And so dolichopodids and surfid flies lay their eggs where there are aphids. And those aphids tend to be at the ear level or maybe along the stem um, getting to the ground. So that was, we thought that was kind of interesting. Um, what we also found, thought was really interesting was um, the remarkable diversity of bees that we found in both corn and soybean fields. And we published this in a couple of places. Um, this was a bit shocking to me. Uh, if you had asked me before at the start, how many bees do you think you're going to see in these fields? I would have said, I don't know, maybe a handful. Um, but we're at 50 species and it's an underestimate because uh, the majority of what we found, we've only identified to the genus. This is uh, an individual representing lazy oglossum. There are multiple species within this genus that we're still trying to account for. So 25% of everything that we found falls within this category. 20% were Agapostomons varescens, this beautiful metallic bee. Uh, about 22% were spread between these two, Melosoides agilis and Melosoides biomaculata, two pretty robust solitary bees. 8% were Toxomerus marginatus. Yep, that's not a bee, that's a surfid fly. It mimics a bee. Um, and one thing that was a little bit surprising to us was just how few honeybees we found. And that, uh, that might be for a couple of reasons. It might be that these crops aren't attractive to honeybees. It could be, as Jim pointed out, we're just not keeping bees around these fields um, or uh, we are and they're not doing too well. You know, the pesticides and the environment just aren't favorable for them. You can find more about if any of this interests you. All of this is published and is open access. And this last paper talks a little bit about what the implications might be for pollinator conservation that so many bees are found in these fields. But it gets me to part two of, well, should we be, should we be using bee bowls? And this is another paper that was published in 2020 titled The State of Bee Monitoring in the United States, a call to refocus away from bee bowls or from bee bull traps and towards more effective methods. And the authors note that bee bulls do not monitor changes in bee abundance. And as a result, year to year data collected from bull traps provide almost no information about whether bee populations are going up and down. And so this is kind of disconcerting because if we're gonna start spending money and changing how we use the land and practice conservation or farm, if we can't, account for a change in bee abundance, then how do we know if what we're doing is working? And if bee bowls are a common tool, um, then, and as Portman says, they're not tracking abundance, then we won't know if what we're doing is having a difference. So we started exploring this a little while, uh, because in our neck of the woods, we have a hard time keeping bees. Uh, this is from um, the Bee Informed Partnership. This was one of the worst years in terms of survey results. Uh, the average reported loss for uh, 
Honeybee colonies in Iowa was 61%. I'm told we're getting close to 80% uh, after this summer, or I'm sorry, after this winter, but um, stay tuned. Those data aren't in yet. Oh, I see something in the uh, chat. When pan traps are so super inefficient, why bother with pan traps? Um, well, I, hold on, we'll get to that. But uh, one reason we use traps at all is because we don't have the money to pay people to go out and just stare and look at flowers. Uh, and um, many biologists were using these as a way to spread their limited research dollars. At the time, um, when we were doing the research, we weren't aware of the concerns from other biologists. Um, so we kept on with it. Oh, and I should point out, going back a bit to the setting the stage for this next part, Iowa, hard time keeping bees. Beekeepers are reporting high losses. And as I pointed out earlier, when I was talking a little bit about myself, um, we've seen an increase in insecticide use. So these are the four main commodities grown in the United States. And as they used to say on the uh, kids show, you know, one of these things is doing its own thing. Come on, can you guess which one? Can you guess which crop is doing its own thing before my song is done? Now my song is done. Which one in terms of the Y axis here is wh which are indices of environmental impact. And these are the different indices here in the different colored lines. This was measured by a group of uh, toxicologists out of, uh, I, I believe they were out of Berkeley. And they collected a bunch of data to track how the environmental impact of growing these crops was playing out over a 10 year period. And what's interesting, they note for corn and cotton, especially a little bit for wheat was either flatline or decline in the environmental impact of growing these crops, in part because there had been a switch from um, synthetic foliar applications of insecticides because of a switch to genetically modified crops. But soybeans didn't see that trend, in part because we don't grow genetically modified soybeans that produce toxins that attack insects, and because in this 10-year period, the soybean aphid arrived. So we saw this remarkable increase in insecticide use. And as a result, the quantity of insecticides applied to soybeans, as the authors note, between this 10-year period quadrupled. So, we went from are there asking the question, are there bees in Iowa to do honeybees survive at all? And we hired a postdoc, Dr. Amy Toth and I um, at Iowa State hired Adam Dozal, um, who was a doctor, a re recent PhD, uh, came to Iowa State. He's now an associate, prof I'm sorry, assistant professor at University of Illinois. And working with Adam, uh, we asked a series of questions with, uh, about how bees are responding to our landscape. So we put honeybee hot colonies out at commercial soybean farms, right at the edge of a field. And we put these little mini apiaries of four colonies per pallet right at the edge. And then we tracked their, the honeybee growth, the colony growth, we also tracked the honeybees and wild bees use of the adjacent soybean field by putting those pan traps out in them. We also asked some questions about whether the soybeans were affected by uh, visits by bees. Um, that's a little bit of a side note and I can talk more about that later. But what I wanna focus on are these pan traps because um, again, the question is, well, are they actually capturing anything? Can you really track honeybee use with these pan traps. And now in this experiment, we're putting bees right next to the soybean field. So going back to, well, why did you see so few bees? Maybe they weren't there. Well, this, for sure we know they're there because we put them there. And we set up this uh, interesting uh, for us, uh, but relatively simple experimental design to ask the question about whether honeybees benefit from soybeans and if soybeans benefit from honeybees. And we had two treatment categories. Uh, the bee community, with or without honeybees. And so we had soybean fields with honeybees, this row, or no honeybees, and there were no bees being kept within a three mile radius of that soybean field. So this row, so just, if there's any bees there, they're just native bees. And then we looked 
looked at the landscape, whether there was high or low cultivation, and we defined high cultivation by fields that were surrounded by 80% or more of corn and soybeans, and that's it. Or low cultivation, which was less than 50% corn and soybeans. So there's more diversity in these low cultivation landscapes. Diversity meaning there's pasture, there's some uh, possibly prairie, although very little, there's some urban environment, maybe there's some riparian area, but there's something other than corn and soybeans that these bees might be foraging on. We've published this data in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, in part because um, we saw something really interesting, that honeybees thrived in this landscape, regardless of the level of cultivation, but by August, no matter where they were, they all started losing weight. Um, and we could reverse that weight loss by giving those bees access to prairie, which is again, something I'm gonna talk a little bit about later at the end. But getting back to, are there bees using soybeans at all? Um, well, uh, Ashley St. Clair, the, one of the graduate students on this project, answered what my teenage daughter calls the no duh question, which is, yeah, if you put an apiary next to a soybean field, you will dramatically increase the number of honeybees you find in that soybean field, as opposed to a field where there is no apiary. And you might say, but Matt, you still found some there. Yeah, it turns out that as much as we try to control for other beekeepers and feral bee colonies in the area, there was one field where uh, there was a beekeeper within a half mile radius who hadn't registered his hive, uh, so we couldn't uh, accurately account for that. But pretty clearly, in terms of what we could control for, if we put that little four colony apiary next to a soybean field, we were getting more honeybees in that soybean field. So we could affect abundance. And then we started asking questions about, all right, so four colonies, what's that? That's pretty small. Um, commercial beekeepers work at much larger scales. Now, we're not California here in Iowa. We have some large scale beekeepers, but most of ours are sideliners. And we've surveyed some of them and they've told us that at a apiary, they typically have 20 to 30 hives. That's pushing the limits of what they, you know, anything more than that is really pushing the limits of what they hope to get out of, uh, out of those uh, hives in terms of a harvest. So we started, uh, we did some additional experiments that I won't go into too much detail with where we varied the abundance of colonies. We varied the apiary size from uh, four that we started out in our earlier experiments to up to 16. And we tracked the abundance of bees in those colonies. So uh, Gu Zhang, a recent PhD student who's now working at the Washington State University, Gu would go out and estimate brood by laying down a little uh, uh, grid here to see how much brood was in a, each frame. And then he would estimate, in this picture, frame side of adult bees, how many uh, sides of uh, the frames were covered in adult bees. And this gives us an estimate of adult population. Make sense? So what we found was the total number of honeybees in, a, uh, in the bee bowls is on this y-axis. And the, the amount of cap brood in the colony, there, there was no relationship. Our R squared value, which is a, this R squared equals some number. This is an estimate of how much of this explains how uh, the uh, uh, one factor explains the other factor. Cap root didn't explain much. Total adult bee population didn't either. Um, and I was a little bit surprised by this because these adult bees are eventually, even though they're on the frames, they're eventually the foragers that go out and would be captured by these bulls. But as the honey biologist that I work with told me, um, I might be thinking about honeybee foraging in a wrong way. Because um, it's not how many adult bees are there, but it's how many colonies are there. 
because colonies are a super organism. They're sending out scouts to go find places to then recruit other workers to go investigate. So don't think about I was told, don't think about how many bees are there in terms of like adult bees, but think about how many colonies are there. And when we analyzed from multiple experiments, how many bees we were, how many honeybees we were capturing in the, pony, in the pan traps versus how many colonies were next to those soybean fields, our R square value increased by a factor of 10. Now, this is telling me that only about 10 to 11% of the variation in pan traps in those bee bowls is explained by the number of colonies. Um, but there is a relationship and statistically it's significant. And I have to point out to you that this was not um, what I would call a controlled experiment. This is more of a meta-analysis where we took data from multiple experiments and combined them together. Uh, some of this data is coming at different times. Uh, we didn't control for all the variables that we would like to. Um, but it was a way to see if there was some evidence that counter to what our colleagues were telling us, bee bulls could estimate bee abundance. And in this way, give us an estimate of just how many bees are out there. So do bee bulls estimate honeybee abundance? Well, got to remind myself and, uh, that honeybees are a super organism whose foraging is directed by scouts and if scouts are trapped, they can't recruit more bees to a bee bowl. All right, so we're not going to see a change in how many bees are captured based on the total adult population in the colonies. But so, oh, so bigger colonies don't result in more bees in the bee bowls, but more colonies do because those colonies are the ones sending out those scouts that we think we're capturing in those bee bowls. And that gives us some idea of. Uh, how many bees, how many, uh, how much bee activity, honeybee activity might be going on in that adjacent field. And that's gonna be important if we're gonna start thinking about the contribution of those different crops to impacts on bee mortality and health. I should point out this, and this is kind of interesting. Um, I appreciate that you all are honeybee keepers. You might not have a great interest in um, native bee or native bee conservation, but it's a topic that's becoming of interest to many ecologists and people who are trying to practice conservation. Because the concern is that honeybees and native bees might interact negatively. In some ways, they're competitors. And we had this interesting experimental design where we could ask questions about sites with bees, all, you know, native bees and honeybees, versus sites with only native bees. And we could also ask if the landscape around that, uh, that those fields are affecting uh, the bees diversity and abundance. So Ashley summarized uh, the data from that, all of those bee bowls, not just the amount of honeybees, but the amount of wild bees. And what she found was that our treatment structure didn't explain, uh, didn't, uh, explain differences in abundance. Um, Statistically, there's no difference here in this first graph. Uh, the abundance of all wild bees was the same regardless of cultivation, either high or low, or presence absence of, a, of an apiary. But where we did see a statistical significance is in terms of richness, which is a, a fancy way of saying the number of species. Within the high cultivation, fields, those that were just dominated, those locations that were just dominated by corn and soybeans, presence of an apiary didn't matter. They, there was low abundance, or I'm sorry, not abundance, richness, low species diversity of wild bees. But in the low cultivation field, we saw those locations where there were more diverse elements in the landscape, we saw more species of wild bees. And we did not see an effect of and the apiary being present. And that gives us some hope that at least in this setting, soybean fields, we don't see evidence of honeybees and wild bees negatively interacting. They seem to be able to get along and use that resource such that they can both persist. What's more important from this, at least what this data suggests is how we're using the land. And if there's, 
more non-crop features in the landscape, well, we're going to get more species diversity, at least of wild bees. So just to, uh, again, there's a little inside baseball, very uh, egg heady kind of topic for an entomologist, but um, I think it might give you some insight into how applied entomologists like me are asking questions about, well, where are these bees and what are they responding to? Well, in terms of how we measure it, uh, we came up with some best practices. We should avoid putting these bee bowls on the ground. Uh, that's not telling us the whole story. There are, clearly there are soil nesting bees in the landscape and these bee bowls will pick those up, but the majority of the bees are at the, I keep saying this expression, the business end of the plant, you know, the, the flower. And if we use these bee bowls, and this is now my opinion, um, the other things are kind of based on data, so a little bit more objective, but this is a little bit more subjective. Counter to the co concerns that my colleagues have articulated in the literature, that beebles can't measure anything, they're useless, they don't measure abundance, they don't measure diversity. Um, I'm gonna respectfully disagree and say that within an experimental design that we account for key factors that affect pollinators, beebles can reveal something to us. They can tell us something about where these bees are, their relative diversity and abundance, and that can give us some insights into what we might do in an area to help them. So last part on this, topic, and then I'll get to some technology. Should bee bowls be used? Part three. Uh, I'm just curious, any of you know what this insect is? Uh, we all do. It's a bumblebee. Uh, which bumblebee? Oh, that's that I don't know. <laughs> that's kind of important. Midwestern, a Midwestern bumblebee. I can guess at that. <laughs> all right. You, yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, there's something special about this bumblebee, though. Beyond, uh, and it's not limited just to the Midwest, it's found on the East Coast as well, or used to be found on the East, uh, East Coast. It's a little bit of a hint. Oh, looking at the chat, what do we got? Sure, there, there are many species, 40 some species of bumblebees, but this one is pretty unique. The rusty backed North American bumblebee. Rusty patched bumblebee, why is that special? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> have what's that? You'll have to tell us. Probably because it's yeah. uh, uh, easily easily tracked in the literature, maybe. Um, not, actually, it's kind of the opposite. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee is the first bee species to be listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the continental United States. There are eight species of bees that have been listed as endangered in, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The first seven were all located in Hawaii. Now, species going extinct on islands, um, not a unusual phenomenon. But continental-wide, uh, that's kind of a big deal. So why would it be good to know where this insect is? Well, now that it's federally listed, uh, the federal government is involved in trying to develop and implement a plan to recover it. This species range has decreased by about 80%. It used to be found um, into Iowa, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, all the way to the East Coast, but now its range has dropped off dramatically. So would you recommend bee bowls for monitoring this insect? Depends on the abundance. Um, if it's if the bee bowls are taking out, you know, one bumblebee in a million, it probably isn't going to hurt. I wish we had a million of these. <laughs> and we don't know how many we have. And being listed means that it's close to what uh, many ecologists consider the brink of extinction. So a non-destructive sampling method is preferred, if not required when it comes to accounting for the occurrence of this critter. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Does that make sense? Oh. Yeah. Let me, let me bring, oh, I, I wanted to share one more slide. Um, so this is this species and others 
has precipitated the creation of the U.S. National Native Bee Monitoring Research Committee Network, or I'm sorry, Research Coordination Network. It's a USDA funded effort to coordinate and support efforts to monitor native bee populations in the U.S. with the broader goal of conserving our nation's native bee fauna. You can visit this website to learn more about it. Um, so again, I recognize you're all honey beekeepers. You might not find this that interesting. Um, maybe it's yeah, a little bit interesting. Um, I find it interesting because um, there's some tension growing between how we conserve native bees and how that overlaps with beekeeping. And there's evidence uh, growing that honeybees, which are not native, might interfere with the um, survival success of wild bees, especially those that are endangered. And it's becoming challenging to study these because some are at the verge of extinction. So having a non-destructive sampling tool would be really useful. I think I was told a lot of you are, I shouldn't say X, maybe you're always an engineer. Is that true? Many of you are retired engineers? Uh, I think uh, your uh, sponsor, uh, uh, Jerry is definitely a retired engineer. I'm, I'm a semi-retired statistician. Um, actually, we're from all over the shop. I think Doug, who's on here, is like a retired contractor. Oh, so. oh, interesting. Sue, I thought you were, I saw some lips moving, Sue, but I didn't know if you were, you were talking. I couldn't hear you. Oh, see, this is good. Sue is a chef. A chef. Oh, very good. Um, if you got time, I'll tell you a little story about how uh, working with some engineers, we're trying to come up with a non-destructive way of sampling for all bees. Um, and this, I'll, I'll tell you this little story and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with the, the beekeeping um, fun fact. So um, I was working with a group of students that uh, are part of an innovation center and they created a project they called Insect Decide. And their goal was to use sound as a detection method. And uh, this young man who's a aerospace engineer, Brenner Strickney, uh, gave a report to the North Central Branch of the Entomological Society of America. I'm gonna share his report with you all. Um, kind of an interesting story, and I, I think it's where we're headed when it comes to this effort to track where bees are in an environment, especially given the current status of at least the rusty patch and, and maybe others in the near future that are listed as endangered and are going to restrict the kind of research we do. So again, current problem, uh, bees are in decline, some are listed as endangered, headed towards extinction. Sampling methods that we use are destructive. You know, this is a modified vacuum cleaner that some entomologists use to suck the bees off of flowers. I just told you about bee bowls, but they're destructive. There are some solutions that are non-destructive. Uh, there are cameras that have been modified to track wildlife. Uh, these are commercially available. They have a fairly long range in terms of what they can see uh, and they're cheaper than paying humans to go out and look for things. Problem is, it's a camera. It's, there are visual obstructions, there's limited line of sight, and especially for insects, these tiny little things of which there are at least a million species identified. <clears throat> there's some 4,000 species of native bees in North America. There's limited post data processing. You can't just run an algorithm on the video and get a report of how many bees are there. You got to do it with your eye. Audio is another way to non-destructively determine the abundance and diversity of critters. 
This is used by ornithologists and it's well-established uh, technology methodology. It's partially omnidirectional, depending upon the type of microphone you have. Um, you can direct it to some extent, but other microphones can be more omnidirectional. There's limited audio interference. Um, the problem here is um, for insects, they're quieter than birds. Birds deliberately sing loud because they wanna be heard. They wanna attract a mate. Some insects make sounds that are loud to attract a mate, but they're much quieter than our birds, uh, in part because a lot of those insects are afraid of being eaten by birds. And again, with the, the visual side of things, there's limited post data processing. Even the ornithologist who use these uh, automated recording units in the field have to sit down with headphones and listen to the recordings to identify which birds they hear. So when I told this to the engineers, they're like, oh, you got a problem? We got solutions. So they wanted to exploit the existing audio technology with uh, some work that they had been learning about, some tools they've been learning out in the field of machine learning. So this is Brenner's uh, work. He's gonna, uh, I'm gonna walk through his slides here and his five steps to this problem. So the first thing they wanted to do is uh, start with the audio recording. As Brenner uh, demonstrates, um, sure you can use a camera, but you can hear me even though right now, you can't see me. <laughs> and that could be a big benefit when you're trying to track uncommon rare flying species like bees. So they stuck with audio data collection. They started with uh, some microphones, a couple of commercial ones that they bought, and they focused on bumblebees. Uh, we didn't use the rusty patch bumblebee. We used Bombus impatiens and Bombus pennsylvanicus part because we could find these. And two, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service isn't going to care if we capture them and if they happen to die in this experiment. We also used honeybees because in the end, we wanted to do an experiment to see if we could separate out bumblebees from honeybees as a proof of concept. We recorded the bees in an anechoic chamber. Um, this is found deep in the heart of ISU uh, in the engineering uh, campus. Uh, we uh, one of the students went out and captured a bunch of uh, bumblebees and honeybees, brought them in and recorded them flying with the two microphones. They also recorded them flying at our uh, Iowa State University apiary, both around a hive, but also around an artificial flower. We kind of capture those flying sound in different environments. They collected the recorded insects, so we knew exactly which species it was that made that sound. And of course, we knew which ones were flying in the anechoic chamber. And um, I can't promise you that no insects were harmed in this experiment, but I can promise you because uh, we had to ensure that there were no bees left behind in the anechoic chamber. So uh, data collection, data loading. Uh, this is where, um, I'm working from a script and the script here is uh, this, uh, the engineers used a Fourier transformation to take the data that they had in the recording that involves multiple uh, axes and put it into a two-dimensional format. So there's a time domain and a frequency domain for audio recordings. They developed uh, a two-dimensional image like you see here with the spectrograph. And some initial uh, creation of the spectrographs from these recordings, at least to the eye, suggests that, yeah, you can differentiate honeybee sounds as represented in this transformation from bumblebees. Then the question is, well, sure, human eye might be able to tell this, but again, we got a lot of data. Can we use machine learning to go through that data and uh, more rapidly assess what we've got. So model definition, uh, turns out that the exploration of machine learning to identify uh, the sound that an organism makes is part of ongoing work amongst ornithologists and the bird cleft challenge is looking to uh, do this. The students use the techniques that have been developed in this challenge and brought them into the machine learning 
process that they're developing. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with machine learning, I'm told it, way, it plays out something like this in this um, diagram where you have some visual input, like a two-dimensional image that the machine identifies features, classifies them such that it can teach itself which things are a car or closely related and which things are not so closely related. And over the course of some iterative processes, it can get better at determining which is a car and which is not a car. In this case, which is a honeybee, which is not a honeybee. And then they test it. They test and train it. So they had uh, shoot uh, a bunch of recordings. Um, no, call, what they call no call, no sound of a of an insect. They had 847 of these recordings. They had 180 recordings of humble of honeybees, 401 of the different bumblebees combined, and they produced those spectrograms for two second um, uh, recordings and then trained the machine learning program on 80% of those and then tested them on 20% that were held aside. And they selected these at random. <clears throat> this is still a work in progress. This is not the students' day jobs. They're all uh, uh, working towards their degrees. This was a side project uh, that we got a little bit of money to do, mostly just to buy the equipment. And then uh, the students you know, on their spare time, uh, went through processing the files and running the, the software. But this is some results and I'm kind of excited about this. I think this is really cool. Um, they're telling me that the training accuracy just based on you know, the files that they uh, gave to the computer and said, okay, this is no, no call, this is only be this is Bumblebee, 20, no, 93% accuracy. They could identify uh, what the, the file is. And then when they told the, you know, they just gave the computer, uh, the machine learning program, the, uh, the recording and didn't tell it what it was and the computer had to predict 90% accuracy. Now, not 100%, uh, but it's pretty good in terms of separating out honeybee from bumblebee. And, uh, they're now working to develop a model, a model de de deployment, as the engineers say, to, uh, some way to get this into a field setting. And this is interesting because if it's successful, this could help people like me and people that work in conservation and agriculture better assess where bees are. And you might ask, well, who cares? Well, you might care uh, if you're trying to keep bees in a place like this, this prairie strip that is established with federal money to conserve biodiversity. And if it turns out that a rusty patch bumblebee is here, we got an interesting situation where you might not want to keep honeybees there. And the students think a little bit more broadly. They said, well, you know what? If this can detect bees and separate out honeybees from bumblebees and maybe other bees, why can't it be used for all insects? And there's a growing field called digital agriculture, which is somewhat synonymous with what agronomists here call precision agriculture. Precision agriculture is an attempt to use all of the data that we can collect from farm fields to more precisely use the various inputs that are needed to grow these crops. And this is just a little cartoon of the kind of information that's collected at harvest, where the farmer, as he's harvesting, uh, what is this, a cornfield or a wheat field, is measuring the yield at that precise location, often to a, you know, a sub-meter scale. And this helps the farmer know which, field, which part of his field or her fields needs fertilizer versus which is doing okay. And this could be expanded to not just to when we're harvesting, but to when we're driving through the fields, scouting and applying pesticides, only using a pesticide where it's needed and where it's not and where there might be 
with potential non-target impacts. All right, so you're all beekeepers. Now for the beekeeping part, and then I'll, I'll stop talking. So how good is conservation for beekeeping? Well, this is a prairie strip. It's a new practice that's in the 2018 Farm Bill that farmers can uh, get paid for uh, to put in their fields. And they, why would a farmer do this? Well, this could act as a barrier to soil erosion. We've seen a 90% reduction in sediment loss when these are put into fields on the contour, the hillside or uh, catchment. They can also increase biodiversity. All of these are native plants. And that in and of itself is an increase in biodiversity. And we've also seen that we can increase the abundance and diversity of wild bees. So this is a win-win. We recently compared these prairie strips, farms with these prairie strips to farms without them that had grassy field edges or what we call grass waterways, which are grass strips that run um, along a hillside to move water off a field. And when we put those four apiaries, the four colony apiaries out at these fields, this is what we see. We started its uh, controlled size and we tracked that growth over time. And early on, growth is numerically a little bit higher in the strip sites. But by the time we get to August, which is when we see our, our peak honey flow and when we would harvest our honey, statistically, we see more honey in those hives. Is, is, is the bars the bars, the mean, the SD of the mean, or is it actually representing the, the, the variability in the colonies themselves? Okay, so uh, each one of these uh, dots represents an average of uh, seven loca six locations, and that's the average colony weight across all the locations. And then the, the error bars are the standard error of the mean. And the asterisk represents, um, a statistical difference using an LS means test um, to a, a 0.05 uh, okay. uh, level. So with some confidence, we can say that over the course of three years that uh, is represented, three years uh, of data, we get more honey when we keep bees at a farm with a prairie strip than without. And this is, again, kind of an egg heady ivory tower way of representing this. This is what it looks like in the field. So this is in August in 2019, the last year of the study. Um, we're adding supers as needed. Uh, just before honey harvest, these colonies each have three supers. Those at the prairie strips had four. And so on. And that kind of visually shows you the type of increased productivity we're seeing when these prairie strips are in our landscape. And going forward, you know, if, if we get questions about, well, are we harming the wild bees by having this non-native species there? Are there rusty patch bumblebees? You know, those kind of those kind of tools that I just talked about would be helpful. It all goes, it could also be helpful in knowing when honeybees are active in these environments and give us some insight into uh, what time of year bees are using, say, the crop fields versus the prairie strips. And if there's a need to adjust the prairie strips, maybe to make them more attractive throughout the year. All right, I'm going to stop sharing because, as I said, I'm a recovering extrovert and I need to know when to stop. So oh, I, I have a question about the machine learning um, uh, piece, which I think is kind of cool. Wouldn't you have to train it on a pretty solid diversity of insect noises or insect flights in order to get any kind of discrimination? Or is it that you only have to train it on bumblebees and honeybees 
to get something? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we started off with just proof of concept. Could we differentiate between those two types of bees? Um, but you're right, at some point we would have to create a library of um, the types of bees that, that might encounter, the types of insects that it might encounter to more accurately assess what's there. Our goal um, is to improve upon the efficiency of what we currently do. And if, if we can uh, get a better sense of what's out there, uh, that would help us uh, with an automated technique like a microphone, running the data through uh, a machine learning program, um, that can help us spread our limited conservation dollars further. I have another question, which is a bit tangential, which is, is there any hypotheses about why the prairie strips are so much better than the unmanaged verges and so on? Yeah, I can, um, I can show you some data. I can just tell you that the, the prairie strips have not only more, more species of flowering plants, in part because we put more there, right? Um, but they also have more flowers. So the, so we, uh, the prairie, we, well, excuse me, I, I actually didn't know about these prairie strips at all, and probably not too many of the other people even knew about them either. Uh, are they like, uh, are, they, are the farmers given seeds that they, they like plow and then sow, or what, what is a prairie strip exactly? Yeah, let me, um, it looks, it, it can look something like this. A prairie strip is um, technically, it's a conservation practice that is sponsored by the Conservation Reserve Program, which is administered by the USDA. So the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program has dozens of conservation practices that farmers can enroll in and get uh, financial support and uh, uh, training to implement. The Prairie Strip Practice, CP43, is one of those practices. And if the farmer requests to set land aside in, in this practice, they can sign a contract for up to, I think it's 12 years, and they get a, a, a check uh, from the government to compensate them for the land that is taken out of production. So it's a question of, can they make more money off of setting the land aside or growing a crop on it? So it's also dependent on uh, what the demands of uh, worldwide uh, um, markets are for crops. So this can be affected by whether you're making ethanol for uh, fuel now because we've got a, a, a war crisis going on versus other times when the markets are saturated. Yeah, so enrollment in CRP fluctuates uh, with uh, several factors. One of them is commodity prices. Um, and in the last ethanol boom, we saw a loss of 500,000 acres that was in CRP to uh, land that was put back into production. This practice is a little bit different from other practices in that we've demonstrated that uh, prairie strips can benefit um, aspects of farming that are valuable to farmers, which is soil conservation. Soil is the business end of the farm for a farmer. If they lose their topsoil, they lose their ability to grow crops. And prairie strips acts as a barrier to the movement of soil down a slope. 
It also acts as a barrier to the movement of nutrients down that hillside. It captures nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's important because much of the farming land in the Mississippi uh, watershed contributes to nitrogen and phosphorus that go down to the base of the watershed and create an anoxic zone, an oxygen less area of the Gulf of Mexico, the size of New Jersey. And anoxic zones are not unique to the Mississippi watershed. They're commonly found in watersheds where farming and human disturbances are common. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because not only do farmers get a paycheck uh, when they practice something like uh, prairie strips, but they also contribute to limiting the environmental impact of farming, not only to their land, but to the larger landscape. And they're making the land better for honeybees. And native bees, presumably. Yeah, yeah, that is that we've documented. Do, do I've got to, do, do they actually give out like seeds and stuff? Because I'm sure the seed banks for all the original prairie are gone. Yeah, uh, they don't give out seed banks, but they uh, there are commercial sources of uh, native prairie plants okay. and ecotypes that are appropriate for this part of the world. So um, yeah, there's a, a bit of an industry now for uh, supplying the need of commercial scale farming, conventional commercial scale farming, but also uh, just general public that's interested in these plants and establishing prairie reconstructions or improving prairie habitat, improving the, the abundance of these prairie species. Getting back to, uh, to sound again uh, for a minute, uh, one presumes that drones sound different than um, regular worker honeybees. Um, one presumes that perhaps you could um, map um, drone congregation areas and drone flyways. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, it's not something that my lab is working towards. We're more interested in where the bees are foraging, so where the, the workers are. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it would be uh, outside the realm of possibility to... It's just another sound in your library. Yeah, yeah. And well, let's see, you, you, obviously one of your sampling towers uh, samples a uh, certain geographic area or you know, expanse. Uh, Smaller than a football field, I presume. Larger than a, a bedroom. Um, not quite sure what you're asking. If you're asking, oh, I'm, I'm asking for a comparison about uh, your sensitivity to audio signals. How far away you can hear oh, insects of um, various kinds compared to uh, yeah, yeah, that, sampling. Uh, the engineers actually gave me an estimate of that for. Uh, the volume, the decibels that the that are produced by the wing vibrations, and how sensitive the commercial microphones were, and I think they said it was, you know, within two to three meters, so more bedroom than than football field, depending on species. Yeah, yeah. Although I, I was shocked at how sensitive the microphones were, I, I kind of surprised they were able to pick up. The sounds that they did. It's Would you then use the the cup trap with the microphone instead of soapy water? Because it's um, uh, is that Tom? Yeah, that was me. Um, yeah, that's the uh, that I think is the ultimate trick. Is you know, it, it wouldn't be a standalone microphone. It would likely be attached to some kind of artificial flower or. Uh, habitat where we, you know, a set of flowers or plants or soil type that we expect a certain bee to be found or group of bees to be found. Um, but yeah, it would, um, if we're gonna go out, let's say looking for the rusty patch bumblebee, um, we're likely gonna have to have some kind of attractant that would increase our likelihood of finding it. 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's great. So I, in, I've been thinking about alternate methods to non-lethally gather this type of data. And uh, I, I'm a microbiologist, so I often think of genomic DNA and things like that. And I've heard things here and there of environmental DNA. And I'm just curious if there are studies that you know of that maybe sample soil from fields in different locations and search for specific sequences that may align with different species of, of different bees. Yeah, I've heard of those studies too. Um, I haven't really explored them all that off that much because my sense is they, well, one, they're, I'm, uh, they're kind of expensive <laughs> to, to yeah, run. Certainly. Yeah. And the scale that we're working, we would have hundreds, if not thousands of samples. So we're, we're priced out of that market. Um, the other, uh, but um, yeah. And the other concern I have is like, you know, how, what's the time sequence that you're actually sampling? Is it what critters were there that season or right. last yeah, year? I, it, Exactly. Yeah. It could be, you know, decades old or something. I, I, yeah. I have no idea. I'm just, uh, yeah. And I, and I should say experiment. that, yeah, no, it's, it's, it has been, uh, something that we've, we've talked about, but, um, you know, the price was the first thing that scared us away. Um, and then the other thing is when we capture these insects, there's a lot of information in the individual bee. So we can start asking questions like how much wing wear, is on the wings of the honeybee. And oh, sure. And the, the pollen that you gathered and, yep. and assigned. Yep. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you've had other honeybeeologists talk about wing wear. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of information in that. So um, if bees have a lot of tears on the edge of their wings, that's an indication that they're either old or they've been working hard or maybe both. And uh, one kind of fascinating thing we've learned is that the wing wear of bees that are kept in prairie strips is less than the wing wear of bees kept at just our control sites. And the graduate student that's doing that work has suggested that just being close to these flowering plants means that the foragers don't have to go as far. Their wings don't yeah, wear out sense. as much. Yeah, Kate, uh, Kate's been doing some the measures on that, it's uh, Bouchard is her name, Kate Bouchard. She's a, a PhD student here in uh, Amy Toss lab. Uh, it occurs to me that you might possibly get inquiries from Washington to try and, and map the, um, the flyways of those uh, Asian giant hornets? Um, haven't, we don't have those out here. Um, uh, no, nobody does but, except the Washington. Yeah, and, but, but when you say Washington, you meant Washington state, not necessarily yes. the DC. The northwest corner of Washington state, the southwest corner of British Columbia. Yeah. They haven't called yet, but uh, okay. have have been in touch with our uh, departments of um, natural resource and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They they're looking for ways to map the uh, rusty patch bumblebee and and dozens of other insect species that are uh, of great conservation need. There's a program called the Bumblebee Atlas, uh, which is attempting to map where bumblebees are, and it uses a citizen scientist approach. Um, it, if there are any other questions, um, I think I, I'll, I'll leave my email in the chat. Yeah, my, my daughter's going to slow, Cal Poly slow in earth soil science and forestry and sustainability. And she doesn't always get on these Zooms on the night, but um, I really think she'd be interested in this um, research and should probably watch this 
recording. She's uh, helping Jeremy Rose down there slow with his bees, too. Slow as San Luis Obispo. Right. Thanks for the opportunity to share all this stuff. I hope it wasn't too esoteric. Um, no, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought it was cool. Very cool. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. Likewise. Appreciate it. Thanks for the questions and uh, uh, the feedback. Um, and if you have more, you know, Prairie Strips practice is something that you know catches your fancy. Uh, be happy to take questions and maybe direct your way to some people who have done work in this area. There's a yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I mean, part of the reason I'm interested is my dad didn't inherit the farm. In, instead, his brother did. But this is and this he started doing this like 50 years ago. He he started building verges and replanting verges around the paddocks and then moved to Western Australia, this is Eastern Australia, and then started putting in trees to uh, mitigate the salt problems that they have. So very early sort of conservation stuff without any government support at all. But it was, it was just, I, I just didn't realize that was sort of that far along here. <laughs> um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, the most recent phone calls I've taken have not been from farmers or from uh, people interested in conservation. It's been from solar farm developers. I don't know if this is an issue out in California, uh, but solar farms are limited uh, in where they can develop because of um, a NIMBY problem. NIMBY is an acronym for not in my backyard. <laughs> And there's pushback uh, by communities that uh, are approached about, you know, having a solar farm established. And one thought is that you can make solar farms more palatable to communities by incorporating habitat for pollinators. And there's a beekeeper out here in Minnesota, Dustin Van Ness. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Van Van Ness, maybe. Uh, you can Google solar honey. He has branded honey that he's produced at uh, by keeping bees at solar farms. Um, and there's been some greater acceptance of solar farms by communities when there's been a, an effort to add this type of habitat to it. Yeah, they tried to... Um do that in Dublin over the ridge here in Alameda County and the community was not okay with it. Um, and they were trying to get our club to co-sign with them to develop a um, habitat area. But, um, you know, a lot of the time, well, this was gonna go on what was public land, um, public use land. And so, yeah, they didn't want it in their backyard and um, it was a little bit slick the way they approached us. You know, it was a little bit corporate. So um, we kind of said, nah, <laughs> we don't, we don't was, need that. Was there something in the specific approach that turned you off or was it just the whole package that didn't feel good to you? Yeah, it felt slick. Um, it wasn't really that big an area and it was sort of presented as a rubber stamp. It's not really something they were into. It was like the seal that it's something they had to have to go to city council with and um, talk to neighbors that they were gonna do this thing. Um, but literally they were gonna eat up um, public use space with the the solar panels so it, yeah. it wasn't like they were interested in educating us about it they just yeah. wanted our assent and that seems kind of backwards and leads people to be somewhat suspicious of their motives 
Uh, in the state of Illinois, they passed a law that you uh, developers have to use a scorecard to demonstrate that the practices they would put in place at the solar farm would meet a standard such that they could say that, yeah, this is a, so, a pollinator friendly solar farm. Did you have, did they have similar scorecards that they presented to you all when they, they were- They didn't there? present anything to us really. They just asked for a, a yes. That's really interesting. That is really interesting. So Which we said no. Believe it's sort of <laughs> half baked. Uh, if they're coming at us that way, they just didn't think it through. Yeah, it was just really slick, you know. Yeah. Do you think you would have changed your mind if they had spent more time engaging your group and explaining their practices? Well, it was more um, their interface with the community. And we didn't want to disrepute it ourselves by getting on board with the solar company. The community wasn't for it. So they were, you know, they needed us, um, you know, to, to make them look good. Um, but the community was really not for this. And we just didn't want to, we're trying to, um, we still have a couple of places in Alameda County where it's not legal to keep bees. And that was in and around this area too, these unincorporated areas. So we are trying to get it legal to be backyard beekeepers out there. We don't want <laughs> problems. Well, that's fascinating. That's really, fa they didn't triangulate that at all then. They, um, Interesting. No, well, they didn't. Bob, they didn't really want to talk to us about what we're about. You know, they, they probably didn't even know. They probably have right, you know, they, like somebody who spends an hour a month thinking about it, and and said, "Oh, if we can get the backing of the beekeepers, and um, that's a you know plus for getting this project jammed through." Our club is about 400 uh, mostly urban beekeepers, which puts us in populated areas in the, along the uh, traffic corridors and along the uh, east shore of the San Francisco Bay in various communities. Um, I don't think we have very many uh, members that are uh, really um, very deep suburban or rural at all. In fact, the one rural member we have, uh, or maybe two, are uh, sort of commercial or semi-commercial beekeepers. And, and in fact, uh, the commercial beekeeping operations have a kind of a tough time uh, in, in this climate because uh, urban beekeepers benefit by uh, the horticultural plants that are planted all up and down the, the uh, communities in the Bay Area, which provide forage during the times when it's just too damn dry and uh, unfruitful, unuseful in in the farming areas, ranching areas. So, um, you know, I don't I don't know what they were pitching, um, and they may not have either. They just might have thought, oh well, bees bees like flowers, so beekeepers will like that we're going to plant flowers at these farms, and that'll be good enough. But I don't think they even I even talk about planting flowers. <laughs> What's that? They, they, they didn't even talk about planting flowers. They hadn't thought it through that far. <laughs> well, they probably hadn't uh, thought about bee feces on uh, the solar collectors either, assuming that it's photovoltaic as opposed to uh, some sort of uh, it was heat. PV. It was it was PV. Yeah. I looked at the project. I was interested enough to look at the project. I put a link to an article that some of us wrote about this topic. And it's it's very much Midwestern um, because it focuses on these solar scorecards that state of Illinois put into law. Uh, some other states have done a similar approach. Most it's voluntary. 
I think there's a lot of potential to couple pollinator and just wildlife conservation with solar farms. Um, it's been estimated that we'll need 15 million acres of habitat for pollinators to reverse their declines. And in, in our part of the world, it's been estimated that um, we're gonna need 7 million acres of solar to meet the demands and goals for you know, limiting climate change. Yeah, I think one of the problems with this project was the, the pollinator area was really very small in comparison to the size of the farm they wanted to put up. And then they were um, really encroaching on a walkway, um, a, use a community sort of trail um, that they used. It would be really, um, I think, obvious to, to as you're out walking your dog or, you know, in, on the trail, this, these solar panels, so. Would they it, not have allowed you? Oh, sorry to interrupt, sorry. No, no, it's just, it just seemed, seemed very small, the area, um, maybe even only enough for one hive or two to be out there and we didn't know who would actually go out to take care of this hive. Um, you know, there was those problems too. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I've gotten skeptical responses from beekeepers about prairie strips. Because they're like, look, that's only four, seven acres of prairie and it's surrounded by corn and soybeans. Um, I don't think I can get a honey harvest off of that. And you, we did it with four colonies and these guys and gals are telling me, you know, we typically put 20 bee colonies out, you know. Um, but what we found this last year when we actually built up to a higher scale was we, that little patch went a long way. We were able to get a, a, we were able to double our honey harvest by keeping bees at farms with prairie strips. So, well, I, th I, I thought they were um, like with almonds and um, they, the pollinator, the commercial guys were asking the farmers not to destroy like the mustard that was growing wild on the edges um, and and the almond guys were like, well, we don't want the bees over there. And yeah, the yeah. bee yeah. guys were like, well, they need, they can't just eat almond pollen. They need something else. Um, and trying to encourage them to let stuff grow and leave it alone. Um, So I, I don't, I think some, a lot of beekeepers actually want the um, diversity for their bees in terms of pollen collection than just the monocrop pollen uh, being offered to them. Does your, uh, like Parks and Rec Commission have public land that they seed with flowering plants? I, mean, I think you mentioned that they, there was some of that kind of habitat, but, do you all have conversations with city and county officials about, you know, putting in vegetation, maybe not just for honeybees, but for your wild bees as well? There was talk about doing that under the BART tracks, our train, our commuter train tracks, um, having a uh, habitat way for butterflies. We have a pollinator posse um, group here in the Bay Area that's promoting local pollinators and habitats and causeways for um, pollinators to, to uh, make it successfully in their migratory um, paths. Uh, Dr. Gordon Frankie is a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley who specializes in uh, native pollinators. Um, he has a website called helpabee.org, which has information on uh, planting for uh, native pollinators. Um, I'm not sure that information penetrates to uh, agencies like Caltrans who uh, control what's planted along uh, the freeways and interchanges and so forth. But frankly, I think it would be terrific if they would plant bee-friendly plants in, in those kinds of places, or at least 
maybe more native plants. Uh, I think a lot of the ice plant that used to be common along freeways in California has, has been uh, allowed to die or taken out. Uh, that's probably a good thing. That's an invasive, right? Well, I think it was brought in from uh, South Africa. It's Australian. Australian? <laughs> it's an Australian plant, yeah, the ice plants. And uh, uh, I don't think it's an invasive because it was planted widely, but it, but it, it is, it's not, you don't see it nearly as often as you used to. So it's not invasive in the Bay Area anyway. Well, about 100 years ago, they planted a lot of eucalyptus up and down the uh, San, uh, San Francisco Bay and the east side. And uh, some people are really objecting to that since it's a not, na not a native plant and it tends to uh, chemically do warfare with uh, the native plants. So there's a lot of pressure to try and take that out. And we beekeepers have mixed feelings because it provides a lot of winter forage for our, our urban hives. And all that eucalyptus is blocking views. <laughs> Uh, right. And well, most most of it's up in the in the Berkeley Hills and the Oakland Hills. Right. I don't think it's blocking a lot of blue views up there. Um, um, it might do even better now that all the there's actually twenty to thirty percent die off in the Monterey Pines. So apparently the beetle infestation might have run its course. So. So it's not, not so bad. The, the die off is starting to abate. I was just talking to someone about it recently. Uh, you've planted, you've uh, used your uh, tricolor traps in agricultural fields. Have you also done an equal uh, survey in the uh, native, in the true native areas, uh, as, as well as your planted strips? Um. Yeah, good question. Uh, we we have uh, some of my colleagues have surveyed um, prairie strips um, with uh, other sampling methods. Um, and I've done them you know, uh, with bee bowls um, and uh, what we call pollard walks, which is a way of tracking um, monarchs. Um, but uh, we don't have good records of all of the pollinators that use prairies, in part because we don't have historical records of what was here before European settlers arrived. There's not a before and after. <laughs> we just have after. So, um, and there's no surviving original prairie land to speak of. I was hoping we could kind of wrap up on a positive note there, but. Uh. <laughs> what about, is there any conversations with like um, Native American Indians, what they remember? Yeah, you really need like pin specimens. You know, you, you have to have, uh, as much as there's a lot of um, indigenous knowledge about the land and the ecology, um, you know, we're still finding species. Uh, that even today in, you know, in, in this part of North America. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not something that you can, you know, account for without some, what we call voucher specimens. You know? Sample. Yeah. Um, but to your question about, you know, are there uh, remnants, prairie remnants? Um, Something like 87% of Iowa was prairie before European settlers arrived. Now it's less than 1%. We do have patches of reconstructed prairie and, and it's increasing thanks to things like prairie strips. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, um, we're limited in what we know about the biodiversity. I think we've estimated something like 300 species of wild bees have been found in prairie strips. Um, but that's, um, I, I'm sorry, not wild bees, uh, pollinators. And maybe um, 
And some of those, I'm using pollinator a little loosely. The monarch butterfly isn't a great pollinator. It's you know, maybe more appropriate to call it a flower visitor. Um, so I think we're underestimating that diversity. Did I answer your question? Well, basically you have not been able to, to use your bowls to sample uh, true remnant um, prairie. Um, yeah, we have some limitations on that. The, the, there's the Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge, which is the largest reconstructed prairie in North America, and they don't allow beebles. No. Anyway, I, I have to admit it's 1134 uh, here, well, and I'm starting to fade a little bit. I apologize. Um, no, we, we appreciate thank you. your sacrificing your evening for us. Well, it was really interesting. I, uh, I might follow up with some questions about your interaction with that solar company. Um, we've talked to uh, a bunch of groups. We, we've got some grants in with some solar farms and uh, to the DOE. Um, and I told you I was a recovering extrovert. I, I'm getting so tired, I can't talk. Oh, no, wait, I can talk. Um, but one of the... Um, you know, the DOE wants information, wants data on how these solar farms that have pollinator habitat might work. Um, and we've pushed back a little bit and said, well, do you even know if this is something that communities want? And you all have an interesting case study, right? I mean, of, you know, on paper, I could see the solar company go, well, this makes sense. They'll sign off on it. But it's a, it's a classic example of like, um, uh, too much college, not enough high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of... yeah, I think Ronnie would be uh, somebody to direct him to talk to because she did a lot more of the interface with that company. She, her, her email address is info at alamedabees.org. She's our information person and she's our past president also. I think she was president when those inquiries were being made. Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, we told the DOE, you need, this is a sociology problem. This isn't a, a <laughs> conservation problem. Yeah. And, and we got looks like, what are you talking about? Um, yeah. We're the DOE. We don't, <laughs> we don't do social science. We do science. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. That's not totally fair. Um, but. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, well, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you all. That was really fun. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.